I'm here representing Ge uh, General Dynamics Electric Boat. I'm actually alumnus of uh, URI. I was in the Physics and Mechanical Engineering Department uh, for blast mitigation, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, this year will be myself, uh, Denny Moore, who's really going to start picking this up at uh, General Dynamics and hopefully starting to integrate it into our systems, as well as Yan Soon uh, at URI. Great person to work for. All right, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on General Dynamics. Uh, we've been around since 1899, and we produced our first uh, submarine in 1900, which was the USS Holland. And that was the first submarine commissioned by the United States Navy. Uh, and then another big landmark was the Nautilus in 1955, which was the very first nuclear-powered submarine. So that was a big step forward as well. Right now we're working on a, a number of boats, actually. The Virginia, which is an attack sub. The Columbia, which is a boomer or a ballistic missile submarine. And we're also working a little bit on uh, the future boat, SSNX. Uh, I'd also like to make a quick mention of NIUVT, the Nash, oh, hope I get this right, National Institute of Undersea Vehicle Technology, which is a collaboration with ourselves, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, Yukon, URI, and a couple other companies doing uh, research focused on submarine technology. So if any of you are thinking about going into grad school later on, take a look at NIUVT. They've got a lot of great research going on. Uh, and now they're well-funded, too, so <laughs> it's also a bonus. All right, so uh, why do we care about this? Well, maintenance is a huge, huge portion of the Navy budget, about one-third. So we're talking billions and billions of dollars. And it also comes into uh, what we call the 138 rule, which is depending on where you're servicing something, it can cost as much as eight times what it would originally cost if it's in a hard to reach place on the submarine. So knowing ahead of time what's gonna fail and how would be a really great both time and money saver for us. Uh, the Navy is under cost constraints while the fleet itself is considered undersized for what we wanna do with it and also aging. Um, so there's been a couple of uh, programs to uh, squeeze some more submarines and other things out of that, one being two for four and 12. So by what was 2012, they want two Virginia boats for $4 billion. So we're still on track to producing two Virginias every year. And we're gonna be adding the Columbia to that as well. Uh, right now, the Ohio class, which is the old uh, ballistic missile submarine is being phased out. The Columbia is what's gonna be replacing that. And the SSGNs, the guided missiles version of that boat, is also being phased out. So that needs to get replaced as well. LA, which is the older uh, attack boat class, is being phased out. The older Seawolf class, which was like the high-end super submarine of its time, is considered too expensive and we can't really afford that anymore. Also no good. Um, so this brings us to we got a money problem, we need to cut costs, we've got to make this more efficient and more affordable. Another thing that complicates that is mechanical components long-term performance is not well understood. Kind of what you're hearing from IGT, not a lot of people actually know long-term performance characteristics of their machine. They don't take a lot of data, they kind of do it uh, as it comes. If something breaks, they look at it and say, okay, this is how it broke, but there's not a lot of real good data on how things break most of the time. And also, not all components are commercial off the shelf. Sometimes they're custom built, especially for submarines. You just gotta slap this thing together because it's purpose built to go on the submarine. You don't really know its performance characteristics. And they're also done in very small batch sizes, also complicating the matter. So if we can start to get a better idea of how these things behave and when they're gonna need maintenance, it could help a lot. Well, to complicate the matter even more, submarine life cycles are varied and can go under very extreme conditions. So not only do we have very little knowledge of some of these things, they can see very different environmental factors. 
So backing up a little bit into why and what is a digital twin, you probably all know this already, so I'll be brief on this one. Kind of textbook definition, a digital twin is a digital replica, a twin, of a real world assembly, process, or a systems of a product used to improve lean production or life cycle management. It's basically matching a virtual system with a real world system, containing information about its um, physical systems for use in optimization, FEA, statistic models, machine learning, etc. So this doesn't sound particularly new, but the key characteristics that differentiate this from other statistical models or finite element analysis is that it incorporates multiple analysis and data storage techniques. It mimics exactly its real world counterpart by incorporating all the information we can gather about it. Built conditions, test run on it, operational states, service records, embedded sensors. So, and as the digital, I'm um, sorry, as the component itself changes, the digital twin should change with it. So basically we have a very specific model that's matched up to a very specific component and that model has all the information we know about the component and it's also updated in real time to give us more and more information about it. Um, uh, kind of more general information, uh, digital twin industrial use cases are kind of everywhere. They target maintenance and equipment health, uh, especially predictive maintenance, uh, as well as operation and performance. Right now, what we're concerned with is mostly maintenance, although we'd like to branch out later as well. Uh, monitoring, diagnostics, and prognostics are all um, features that can be incorporated into digital twins, and ideally would be. Uh, a lot of the most digital imp uh, aspects of using a digital twin, EB already does and is actually pretty good at. But there are some things we could get better at, like gathering and organizing all the data that we do get out of all these components that we're looking for. All right, so what do we want? We want to be able to predict the maintenance needs of a component. And last year we used the pump and it worked out very well. You can see it here, I'll roll it forward in a little bit. Um, this year, again, we might be looking at maybe another duplicate of that pump or even uh, a newer one with multiple speeds because at the end of the day, what we really want to do is break one of these pumps in as many ways as we can because what we want to do is we want to see not only how it breaks, but what are some indications of what's breaking and can we use that to predict when it will break and how it will break. Um, Oh, that's what I mentioned right here. We're really looking for those failure modes, and it should fail. I want you to break this thing, hopefully many times, uh, within this project's lifespan. Um, so we'll look at, again, two or three sensors. We found a few worked very well, and I can brief you on that. Uh, flow sensors and um, acoustic, in particular, worked well. We already have a means of record data, but if you come up with something better, great. Uh, choose software, we ended up using MATLAB, which has some built-in uh, digital twin features, which is nice, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You plug it in, use the data you found, and you're good to go. I'd recommend staying with that, but again, if you find something you really like, go nuts. Um, once we've uh, replicated successfully, we're already there, but we might need to do it again if we pick a, a new pump with uh, different characteristics. Uh, the primary focus of the team will be predictive maintenance. Determine the future failure states based on the data we have. Um, so again, we're looking basically to break this thing. And once we've broken it, be able to predict that again. Last year, they just kind of started scratching the surface here. They burned the gasket being the uh, weak point, which is the uh, diaphragm that pumps the water through, puts the pressure on. They uh, burned it, scratched it, put it in acid, uh, eventually used acetone, and that was the you know, best way to damage these. So we'll be looking at it again, this again. How do we damage this? Characterize how that changes uh, how that behaves through the sensors, and then use that to predict its life cycle. Or if it has a catastroph catastrophic failure, you know, how do we know that's going to occur? Uh, 
Um, phase one and phase two are going to be much smaller this year, especially if we uh, take a bunch of the work that was done last year, which I expect we will. But we'll quickly review, you know, the mechanical device, the sensors used, uh, the software platform, if we want to stick with that or if we want to move to something else. Um, we'll estimate the project costs and the schedule. Then we'll go to digital replication. Again, quite a bit of that has been done, so we'll walk through that, what's been done, what we want to add. Uh, I believe there's also a video of this uh, online that you guys can take a look at. Um, the sensor ar architecture, the digital twin architecture and whatnot. Um, they used the Arduino board to take in all the data and actually did some post-processing on that board itself. Um, and lastly, this is going to be the real big one. This is going to take up most of your time and that's the predictive maintenance. We're going to do a lot of testing, so we're going to need to get test results. We're going to need to upgrade the model and then we're really going to start using it for getting predictive data. How accurately can we predict the failure of this given um, certain conditions in it? Um, and then ultimately use the digital twin beyond life. We want to get that prediction and we want to classify any of those anomalies or those failure modes. Again, last year we used acetone, which is kind of a, a physical attack. You guys are much more heavily into the electronics, so what happens when we electronically attack this? We throw, very simply, if we throw too much voltage in it, if we throw too little voltage, current, or not, what happens to the system? And how do we know that? And what kind of damage does it cause? Uh, best anticipated outcomes. So we like a functional prototype capable of monitoring the state of the component, which we actually already have, but we want to expand that uh, using all the sensors and whatnot. Uh, we want to, using the data system, we'll create a digital twin capable of efficiently and accurately monitoring the state of the component, and the digital twin system will be capable of predicting the component's future state. That's a big one as well as detect anomalies using the information that those sensors are providing us. Uh, we're looking for an electrical engineer and computer engineer uh, with the following skills. Probably don't really need to go too deeply into that. Uh, broad implications, this kind of goes back to the beginning. If we can get a reasonable digital twin that we can use on multiple different components, this could potentially be a big money saver for us and the government. Because we are talking about lots of money and lots of specialized equipment that needs a, a good amount of maintenance and sees a lot of different harsh treatment. So that's a real big one for us. All right. <clears throat>